recording. So we're here um, for the biweekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. Um, today, it's our honor to have PhD student Ennis Goloshevsky, um, who is working in the area of formal methods analysis of cryptographic protocols. And today, um, we're going to hear uh, about his continuing work on the FIDO protocol, which is a case study of some broader themes that are very important that he's working on involving cryptographic binding. Um, because of the upcoming uh, uh, SIGC conference, our next CDL meeting will be on um, March 31st. So we're ready to go now. Okay, thank you. So let me get some slides shared. All right, I'm Enes Goloszewski, a PhD student at UMBC working with Professor Sherman. And I'd like to talk to you today about cryptographic binding. The title of the talk is FIDO, Cryptographic Binding Should Not Be Optional. And I'll do my best here to explain what that is. So I wanna begin with the following assurance. We're dealing with a significant problem in protocol design and protocol security. And that problem, which has been ongoing essentially is for as long as network protocols have existed is inadequate cryptographic binding. So this is to say protocols are in many cases, not binding their values using cryptography adequately. And we see this in 1978 with protocols like Needham Schroeder. Needham Schroeder is sort of the canonical example, by the way, if you're learning protocol security for what not to do. And then more recently, we're seeing it with the FIDO UAF version 1.2 standard, which we've been analyzing. And this is as recent as 2020. When you look at the separation between these two, this is 42 years, essentially. And in those 42 years, we're seeing the same mistakes get made, essentially, by protocols over and over. And the solution, while simple, is, is also quite difficult in many cases, and that's to bind cryptographically. And I'll discuss why that's difficult. To So when we talk about protocol security, it helps to begin sort of with the threat model that we're talking about. So traditionally, when you draw diagrams of communicants and protocols, you have, you know, Alice having a line that represents a message emission to Bob, and then Bob responds, et cetera, et cetera. In reality, network communications don't work this way. And a large part of that has to do with the fact that the internet does not work this way. Um, for me, for my voice to reach you right now, for my video feed to reach you right now, I have to go through probably seven or eight hops of network devices, router switches, et cetera. So a more accurate way to capture the layout of a network is sort of with something called the Dolof Yao intruder. This is a threat model from 1983 that Dolof and Yao developed while analyzing public key protocols at the time. So in 1983, public key crypto was really becoming a large topic in protocol design. And one of the observations Dolov and Yao made is that in reality, you can't be certain that you're not passing your messages to intruders when you're communicating with each other due to the layout of the network. And they also observed that this is a very powerful threat model for analyzing protocol security. So in this threat model, the idea is somewhat simple. We're going to pass every message to an adversary. So Dolov Yao intruder quite literally is the network. Um, under these circumstances, it is difficult to communicate securely. And the only way that we really stand a chance against an intruder like this is by using cryptography. The reason for this is the Dolovia intruder is limited cryptographically in the following sense. The intruder can generate cryptographic keys and the intruder can use cryptographic keys that the intruder is aware of. However, the intruder cannot crypto analyze or break cryptographic primitives. And with that in mind, we can start to do things like, well, First, let's talk about why it's an issue if the, if the adversary is able to manipulate messages on a network like this. So I'm getting ahead of myself. The main thing we're trying to prevent when we design secure protocols in a sort of structural sense against the Dolovia adversary, like the one I just discussed, is something called protocol interaction. Protocol interaction is the idea that you can interact or have values interact from one protocol instance let's say an instance like protocol P 
with another instance like protocol Q. So that is to say an adversary can extract information from protocol P and then insert it in the protocol Q. And this actually is the foundation of a man in the middle attack. And if you look at the diagram here, this is actually illustrating what many man in the middle attacks end up look like structurally. The idea is that Alice might initiate a protocol with the adversary or either intentionally or by virtue of the network having a compromise. And then the adversary is going to begin extracting values from that session with Alice and inserting it into a separate protocol session with Bob. Now, one interesting feature of the Dull of Yao model in this context is that another aspect of the DY adversary is that you might, within a network, begin communicating with the DY adversary on purpose. So when I first heard this, I was quite perplexed. You know, why would I ever want to talk to the adversary on purpose? But it turns out that we talk to people we don't know on the internet often. Um, for instance, I don't actually know WebEx, but I'll start HTTPS sessions with WebEx multiple times a week. So in that sense, we really don't know what the recipients of our messages are doing with those messages. And an adversary could potentially do something bad with them. And this is sort of what we want to design our protocols to mitigate. I'd like to talk for a moment about what cryptographic binding is. So cryptographic binding at its heart is somewhat of a simple idea. Um, it's an effort to associate two values together in a way that's difficult for the adversary to separate. And the value of making it difficult for the adversary to separate sort of lies in the previous slide. We want to make this action difficult, ideally. So if we send two values encrypted under, let's say, a secret key K, the issue is, despite the fact that these values are encrypted in the ciphertext and the adversary can't read them, they're still in a sense, useful values. And the adversary can certainly separate them by just using one or the other or both or recomposing them in some other new protocol message. Probably the most simple way to mitigate this is you encrypt values together with their some detail of their context. So in this case, Alice generates a secret and encrypts it with K. And then there's also Alice's identity, which we can also encrypt in K. But the issue here is the secret has no context bound to it. That is to say, Alice did not bind the secret to the context of her protocol instance. And the adversary can now extract the secret, whether the adversary could read it or not, and try to use it in another instance of a different protocol. And binding is the only effective tool I'm aware of for stopping this. So it turns out that binding issues have been plaguing protocols for a long time. I mentioned at the start of the talk that in 1978, there was a Needham Schroeder public key protocol, which had this problem. It turns out that in 1995, Lowe was able to use formal methods to, and he was representing, to do this, he represented this protocol in um, communication sequence processing. And essentially what he was able to find through the use of formal methods tools. And the reason I'm bringing up formal methods tools, by the way, is it turns out this is very hard to find by hand for human beings. Because protocol interaction involves two or more instances of a protocol, generally speaking, and this is hard for us to parse or keep track of in our brains, even for simpler protocols. So the issue here is we have Alice initiating a protocol with Eve. It's called an instance P of Needham Schroeder. And then you have Eve initiating another instance of this protocol. Let's call it instance Q with Bob. Now, Alice does something very sensible. Alice generates a random nonce. This is important, by the way. So this is what this N subscripted with A is. Uh, there's also a nonce for Bob eventually, N subscripted with B. These are random, uniquely generated values for a specific instance of the protocol. So P and Q should have their own nonces, ideally. And secondarily, these are generally generated with cryptographic number generators, so it should be hard for an adversary to preempt these. And this is a pretty good tool, for instance, for making sessions unique or preventing things like replay attacks. But we'll see that in this protocol, there's some problems. So Alice will generate a nonce and then bind it together with to her name. So she actually binds her nonce to her name by encrypting this tuple of values with the Eve's public key. And again, you might say, why would Alice talk to Eve? Well, it's a Dolof Yao network. Eve might be a legitimate network participant. So Alice will send Eve all of this data. Eve, beginning to act maliciously here, creates a protocol interaction. The protocol interaction is quite simple. Eve is gonna take some of Alice's data from instance P, insert it in the instance Q. So you can see that Eve is initiating the protocol with Bob, but using Alice's nonce 
Alice's identity. Now, Bob doesn't know any better at this point. Bob thinks this is Alice initiating the protocol. After all, Eve is claiming to be Alice. So what does Bob do? Bob generates an ounce of his own. So having sort of at this point, Bob has passed Alice's challenge in a way by extracting Alice's nonce from that message because it's encrypted for Bob. However, Alice did not encrypt that message. It was actually Eve. So what Bob will do is follow the protocol. Sensing that nothing is wrong, Bob will generate his own nonce, take his nonce, the nonce he received from Alice and encrypted with Alice's public key. This is because Bob believes he's speaking with Alice. Now, Eve has a problem. Eve does not actually have Alice's private key, so Eve cannot decrypt this message in instance Q of the protocol. But Eve has a concurrent instance of the protocol running, instance P. So what Eve will do is Eve will take Bob's nonce and transplant it from Q to P, protocol interaction again. And in this case, what Eve is essentially doing is Eve is claiming that this message is from Eve, not from Bob. And there's no way for Alice to know because there's nothing in this message that indicates that this message is not from Eve. So Eve sends this message to Alice. Alice decrypts it for Eve. So Alice is acting as a confused deputy now or as a decryption oracle. Um, this is a great scenario for an adversary when you can get an honest user to do work for you. And what Alice does is decrypts Bob's nonce for Eve. Note that Alice in the final message encrypts nonce Bob under Eve's public key. Eve is able to extract this key, send it to Bob, complete both protocols. So Eve has completed both protocols P and Q. And in protocol P, which is the one with Alice, Eve is authenticated to Alice as Eve. In protocol Q, Eve is authenticated to Bob as Alice. And this is quite problematic. And by the way, also not mutual authentication in this case, which is supposed to be one of the goals of this protocol. So this is what it looks like when an adversary is able to find protocol interactions. So I recognize actually that I didn't put the full definition up there. So CPSA is a tool that we use for identifying protocol interactions like this. It stands for Cryptographic Protocol Shapes Analyzer. Um, it's the primary tool we use in the protocol analysis lab at UMBC. The basic idea is that we model protocols using a formal language, using S expressions actually. And then we hand it to S CPSA and CPSA in theory hands us back the different ways the protocol can execute, which generally includes protocol interactions because CPSA considers an arbitrary number of sessions of the protocol running at once. So this is a very, very good tool for finding protocol interaction. Um, I will say that we teach this tool. If you're a student and you're looking to get involved in protocol analysis to find problems like this in protocols, we would be absolutely happy to help you learn. And I'll be running education workshops specifically with this tool centered around using the tool to find protocol interaction. For this project to analyze FIDO, which I haven't gotten to yet, but I will soon, I promise, we used the Cryptographic Protocol Shapes Analyzer. So what the Cryptographic Protocol Shapes Analyzer does is it actually produces shapes. So the name is not lying to you. These shapes resemble protocol diagrams, kind of like the ones we've looked at. Um, so often what CPSA will do is create these things called strands. And you can see that a column is kind of a strand of events. And you might have for something like DM Schroeder, an initiator and a responder. And then CPSA tries to prove the causality of the messages between those two. And if something goes awry, like in the right image, you can see there's a dashed line at the bottom there. This is usually when CPSA is unable to prove that, that something is equivalent between two protocol roles. And generally speaking, this is where you have things like protocol interactions potentially happening. So those are, those are artifacts that we look at more closely. So now I'd like to talk about FIDO. So FIDO stands for Fast Identity Online. So Universal Authentication Framework, UAF, is what we're looking at specifically. And this has been an ongoing work by the FIDO Alliance since about 2017. What FIDO, what FIDO UAF is, is an authentication framework that aims to get rid of passwords in favor of you authenticating using these sort of authentication devices. And generally, this will be your smartphone. Um, so we're looking at things like fingerprints or, or retinal scans, stuff like that. And the idea is that the server asks for some number of these attestations from authenticators. And you receive attestations from your authenticator by essentially passing whatever that local authentication mechanism is. Now, some questions that come up is how does the server know about these authenticators? There are two 
primary protocols in UAF. One is for registration, one is for authentication. In, I'm going to be talking about authentication strictly. So we're assuming that the server already knows about the client's authenticators, but there's a separate protocol, which are, we have uh, students actually in this talk that in the previous semester for the Insure Plus C program or course analyzed the registration part of UAF. And what they found is quite interesting. And I'm hoping that maybe they'll chime in at the end with, with some of their findings. However, I'm gonna focus on authentication for the time being. So again, the idea is server issues challenge to client. The client is gonna get attestations from authenticators. What an attestation is, is basically the authenticator is gonna sign something the client gives it. And then the client can use that to prove to the server that it was able to pass the local authentication mechanisms. So let's talk about how that looks. There's one thing I wanna bring up before. So like any other authentication program, uh, protocol. This protocol will be running on a real network, so it has to deal with a DY adversary. And as we know, DY adversaries want to create protocol interactions, so this protocol must also bind. Now, the issue with this protocol binding is that the binding, some of the binding mechanisms it uses and supports are optional. And the reason they're optional is not technical. It's more coming from the angle of policy. It's quite literally because many clients may or may not have support for the binding mechanism. The issue with that is that this means that not every client has to implement binding and we will explore the result of that in a technical sense. So the way FIDO works is it's a three-party protocol. So you have a client that's gonna initiate the protocol by making a request to a server and the server will initiate FIDO UAF authentication proper by establishing a TLS connection with the client. Now, they might already have a TLS connection previously, but at this point in time, we have to negotiate a TLS connection. So the client does exactly that. The client and the server negotiate a TLS connection with each other. It's fairly standard. I believe we're using TLS right now to talk to each other. And then the server will initiate the protocol by sending this encrypted tuple of values, which includes a policy. The policy is going to state to the client which authenticators are acceptable for the server, which types of authenticators even. It's going to send an app ID. This is the identifier. Usually it's a basically a URL for the resource the client wants to authenticate to. And then there's a challenge. And the challenge is probably the most important part of this first message. This is sort of what the client needs to get attested by the authenticators. And since we're using TLS, the server is going to encrypt this with a server write key, which is, you know, the result of a TLS handshake essentially with the client. So the client now is going to formulate what we call a final challenge for the authenticator. So in this example, I have one authenticator, but you can have an arbitrary number. Each authenticator stores a handle for this particular app ID or for the server rather, and that comes up during registration. And authenticators also ha have negotiated access keys with the client. So the client here has the burden of providing the handle, the access key, and then this group of final challenge parameters, which is a hash of the app ID, something called the facet ID. This would be like a sub resource on the app ID. So if I'm accessing Google, this could be like Google slash mail or something. The challenge that we got from the server, and then optionally a TLS data dictionary, which can contain one of four unique bindings. Those bindings are things like the server's name, a hash of the server's certificate. Um, there's something called a token binding standard. And then we can also have like the client provide essentially a signature of the public key. So there's different ways to bind to the underlying communication channel. Note that the client and the authenticator are communicating out of band in a sense, like they're not communicating on the DY network, but rather the client is physically interacting probably with the authenticator. Um, so the client also has something called a authentication specific module, an ASM, which is responsible for delivering the final challenge and all that to the authenticator. Usually these are on the same device, by the way, it's quite common for the client to access a resource with a smartphone and have the authentication part of it also be on the same smartphone. But the protocol is quite flexible in that respect. So authenticator responds with an attestation, assuming the client passes the local authentication mechanism. This is gonna be something we call S here. It's a signature FC non-scanner. So the authenticator is generating a nonce and using a counter that is specific to the number of times it's authenticated with this particular handle. And the client sends that 
uh, assertion back to the server. Is the client right key across the network? And now the server can be fairly certain, maybe, that the client has managed to get an attestation from the registered authenticator. Now, the problem here is actually relatively familiar if you're sort of scrutinizing this protocol closely, which is that the challenge is not bound to the server's identity. So this is actually the same problem that we saw earlier. And the only way to mitigate this really is for the client to bind to that challenge. But let, remember that this binding is optional. So let's see what happens if you don't have it. If you don't have it, an adversary can initiate the protocol with the server, receive a challenge from the server, and then start to use the client and the authenticator as confused deputies to attest the challenge for it. And that's exactly what happens in this example. The adversary will forward the same challenge to the client initiating an instance of FIDO UAF authentication. The client, unaware that this challenge is from protocol instance P on the right, will pass it to the authenticator, pass the local authentication mechanism, authenticator creates an attestation, adversary replies to the server with that attestation, authenticating as the client. There's some setup you have to do to make this work in real life, like you have to do some registration, but I will say that we've looked at many open source implementations now, and by many, I mean three, maybe I don't want to exaggerate here, but three, three of the most significant open source implementations for FIDO UAF don't implement the channel binding. Uh, it's an optional feature and, you know, they're busy trying to get the protocol to work. So they skip the step. And on top of that, the servers don't really check the, don't really check the details of the attestation either. So things like FCP, making sure it's the right challenge in there, all that stuff. So this attack very much works on real FIDO servers, and we've been able to make it work on at least one actual implementation, which is the eBay UAF implementation. So quite practical as it turns out. Now, there are ways to mitigate this. One of the results of our work is that we suggest an improvement to the protocol and the improvement we suggest is, and again, it's the protocol has an issue against the DY adversary if you're not binding at the client. So the client needs to bind. However, we take the position that the server should also bind the challenge. It's actually not ideal that the server is putting a challenge into the network that has no binding to its origin, because that means that if there's some other issue down the line, adversary can start moving the challenge between protocol contexts. So you want to avoid that. So in this example, this is, by the way, a different kind of visualization, but still very much consistent with what we just saw. The client and the server negotiate a TLS 1.3 session. The server will now generate it to the challenge, but in the following way, the server is going to generate a nonce and hash the nonce together with the server's certificate to create the challenge. What this hash does is it binds the challenge to the server certificate, which is nice. And the server will send a nonce the challenge to the client in, uh, across an encrypted channel. The client will do the same binding. It will take the challenge and hash it with the server certificate again. And now what you have is a dual binding where both the server and the client are binding the challenge to the server certificate cryptographically. If the client is talking to somebody that isn't the server here, this hash, this creation of FCP will indicate that because the client will hash it to a server certificate that does not match the one in the original challenge. And from here, we send it to the authenticator, authenticator receives it, past local authentication mechanism, authenticator signs it by encrypting it with um, its private key. In CPSA vernacular, this is how we do signatures. And then the client can send this attestation back to the server. Now we formally analyzed this model using CPSA. This is actually almost exactly what we analyzed in CPSA. And it turns out that when you do this, the client is the client is able to authenticate the challenge. That is to say the client can check, you know, if the challenge is from who they're talking to by hashing the nonce together with the certificate of who they're talking to. So this is highly desirable. Now the client can stop an inadequately implemented server from steering it down a dark path. And again, we know that all the open source implementations are committing this sin essentially. And since the client is binding, this also means that if the client is talking to an adversary, now the server at the end can check the attestation, you know, if, if the implementation does, because that's not a guarantee, but it has the means at least to check the attestation and determine if the client is speaking to somebody that is not the server. So in, in, in a sense, this is going to stop the protocol interaction I just showed you. And we've sort of proven that using CPSA.
So one of the things that came from this work is this thought of like, well, it seems like a lot of protocols aren't binding correctly. So the question for sort of the cryptographic community is what do we do about this? What can we do about this? And as part of my PhD dissertation, one of the major goals and one of the one of the core parts of the project is this idea of automatic binding to cryptographic contexts. So what is automatic binding? Well, it's this idea that given some protocol, so if I hand you a model of a protocol, sort of formally specified, as you might CPSA, you can automatically, using some software, apply cryptographic bindings to every message. And the way something like this might look, you can see here. So Alice is talking to Bob, and we have this nonce that we want to send to, Alice, to Bob if for Alice. And you might recognize this as sort of like the first message of Needham Schroeder, which only has the nonce and then Alice's name. But let's add some other stuff. Let's add a session identifier for the session of this protocol. Let's actually be clear that we're sending this to Bob. So it's not enough to say it's from Alice. I want to say who it's for. Um, and we can also specify, hey, this is this message in this protocol version. Because one thing I didn't really talk about is you can have protocol interactions between different protocols. And the most powerful form of that is what's called a chosen protocol attack, where the adversary actually gets to design the second protocol that the first protocol will interact with. So that's really the attack we're trying to stop. We encrypt all this under Bob's public key. Second, let me check the time real quick. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to augment CPSA models. So I haven't shown you this yet, but uh, if you think back to when I was talking about CPSA, the way you introduce CPSA to protocols is you model them using this sort of S expression based language. You can define roles, define events, sends, receives, make origination assumptions or constraints rather on the values. And the idea is you might have a protocol like this where you're essentially trying to authenticate two roles, initiator and a responder. This closely follows Needham Schroeder's public key protocol, which we talked about, but this is e even more flawed in the sense that we don't even bind nonce one now. So let's say I come up with this protocol. I'm sending an encryption of nonce one to Bob, and then Bob's going to reply with nonce one and two to me. And we're going to say that from my perspective, nonce one, I'm going to generate freshly, and that's fine. So a tool that's going to automatically bind this protocol. By the way, this protocol is terribly broken. Like if you try to use this as it is right now, like the adversaries can have a field day with it. So what can we do? Well, let's hand it to this hypothetical tool that's going to augment it with binding. And the way the tool is going to do that is it's going to look at what is going on here. It's going to look at these events. It's going to extract the values from it, like things like nonce one, the identifiers B, the identifier A, this origination assumption. So in CPSA, when we say something is uniquely originating, that means that the first person to send that value is creating it fresh. The adversary doesn't initially start with knowledge of it. So we might very well for this first message do something like, well, let's add the identifier of who we're sending it to. And let's add who it's from. And let's add, you know, what version of this message it is, or which message it is, what version of the protocol. So this would be kind of what an automatic binding might look like. And this is absolutely what we're going to be getting, you know, getting this tool to do. Or that's the goal, at least. So I want to talk about what the grand vision for this sort of automated process is, because we can certainly analyze every protocol in existence by hand and, and recommend bindings for them. But it might be interesting to see what happens if we build an automated compiler for protocols that will. So it's what it's going to do. It's going to parse a CPSA model and identify the context. It's going to infer the context of the protocol. And it's going to augment each message with bindings to that context. It can then verify the resulting model. The goal here is to have some sort of proof that the resulting model is resistant to what, again, I called earlier the chosen protocol attack, where the adversary is going to arbitrarily induce protocol interaction between whatever protocol we're binding here and an arbitrary protocol queue. And then sort of in the distant future, using things like the emerging code generation packages for languages like Rust. We'd like to generate executable source code of the resulting model with binding. And then at the end, it'd be real nice, again, if there was also a proof of correctness that this executable source code is correct. And there's a whole sort of field of research around this known as formal verification. There's a lot of very, very intelligent 
people working on how to prove the correctness of executable source code. There are indeed now compilers that compile code that's provably correct. So this is sort of would create this lengthy tool chain wherein the ideas that we can produce protocols that we know are gonna work based on the initial models. So the last thing I wanna talk about is one of the things that came up when we were discussing automatic binding is this idea of like, well, how do we represent large complex protocol states or contexts? And it turns out that a very good fit for this sort of representation finds its way all the way back to 1979 is something called a Merkle tree. So if you've dealt at all with things like linked lists or trees or even blockchains in some cases, you might find this sort of structure familiar. In fact, a blockchain in many ways is, is a Merkle tree with data in it that just has like one, it's just a linked list because it only has one path. But if we create a tree like this, what we can do is, if you go all the way to the bottom of the, of the figure, we have these data blocks, L1, L2, L3, L4, and so on. You can have an arbitrary number of these, and these would be the initial primitives of a context potentially, or they might be a context in of themselves. And the idea is what you can do is you can start to hash these values and then hash, you know, for each root node or each tree node, you can hash the leaves together until eventually you have this hot, this hash at the top, which is going to be a hash representation of the entire context for the protocol. And this method has lots of flexibility when it comes to doing automated binding of any kind, which is to say that we can compose these contexts. One nice thing about a Merkle tree is you can always create another Merkle tree by taking a Merkle tree and hashing it together with another Merkle tree. So if you need to compose two contexts together, you can do that. So this might be quite useful for multi-party protocols. And likewise, it allows you to manage the complexity and size of a context, because if you need to bind to a context in every protocol message, if that context is huge, you're gonna add overhead to a protocol that most protocol implementers and designers probably won't accept. So what we can do is we can use hash trees sort of to mitigate that problem as well. One of the big questions that comes up is how do we represent the context of post quantum protocols? This is something that we're working on in, in PAL is how are we going to represent the context of post quantum protocols that are using these crypto primitives where you might have absolutely huge keys, et cetera, otherwise, where you may not want to re compute the hash of, you know, a multi megabyte size key over and over again, while you're sending the messages around. This is also where a hash tree can come in handy because maybe we don't need to recompute that. We just rehash the previous hash, right? So with that in mind, I've illustrated to you that the FIDO protocol, well, first I illustrated that protocol interaction is a problem, a serious problem that is affecting protocols, you know, for 40 plus years now. I illustrated to you that the FIDO UAF authentication protocol, if you take their optional binding to heart, has quite a problem and the real life implementations reflect that. I've illustrated that there's a way to do a dual binding for FIDO UAF that mitigates the protocol interaction we discussed. And I've also discussed with you a potential way to automatically bind protocols to avoid the issues that we talked about. So what I wanna do now is I wanna open the floor to questions. Hey, Anis, how are you doing? Long time no see. Just a quick question. Is the Merkle tree protocol interaction like an individual contribution or is this already out in the wild? Like a lot of people doing this for the purpose of binding. So most people, when they're cryptographically binding are not doing so necessarily explicitly. I would be shocked if there isn't a protocol out there that uses a Merkle tree for something. I think using a Merkle tree to represent the protocol context that you're binding to in each message is quite novel. I don't think anybody has done that. Unless you're aware of some example. No, I'm not. This actually kind of solves uh, an, an issue I had internally in, a, in a, an independent project I'm working on. So it's, it's, that's why I was curious if I just missed this in the literature or if I just should have talked with you a bit earlier. Um, I mean, if it's, if it's a helpful solution for, you, I assume you're still working on protocols. Is that correct? Yeah. So right now I'm, I'm working on the decentralized captcha protocol and one thing that we detected in the wild is that there's no type of binding whatsoever in uh, the challenge that is provided to you right so you just receive a challenge and what happens often is that people just relay that captcha to a third party to solve 
uh, most of the times the third party is actually getting paid for that, so it's okay. But many times they're just using, they're just tricking people into solving that on behalf of a bot. So it'd be nice if it was kind of like already embedded. And that's one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to figure out. But binding a specific website session is pretty tricky because you have like the, the, the native URL, but then you have kind of like the contents you're trying to access. So it's always a bit of a question to like the best balance to kind of what's the best trade off to kind of like figure out binding because you always have usability and, and, and security as a, a trade off reference there. But yeah, thank you. This is very helpful. This is super nice work. Yeah, I appreciate the providing an example of another yet another instance in real life where inadequate binding is causing this problem. And it often does revolve around issuing challenges, especially in systems where you're getting attestations. And in some sense, that's kind of what a capture is, right? Um, so certainly, I, I hope that I, I'm happy to hear that you find this helpful. And I will say that you're speaking to my heart when you say it's difficult to figure out what to include when you're binding, because I think that is one of the major challenges of binding is figuring out like, okay, what is the context of this protocol? And how do I represent it? Those are like two major questions that I'm trying to an answer. Uh, myself. So let me know what you end up going with. <laughs> That'd be curious to see. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk. Can you um, explain a little bit the context of prior work on what other people have done uh, on FIDO UAF and how yeah. it relates to your work? Absolutely. So it turns out that there's like a fairly large body of prior work on FIDO UAF, and most of it revolves around using a tool named Proverif to do formal methods analysis. There's also like a few papers that do informal analysis. Probably the most significant work that I found in terms of like what we're doing here is a work by Pereira from 2017, where they analyze FIDO UAF. In that work, they use Proverif. They assume there's no uh, channel binding. They don't actually discuss channel binding in the work at all, which I found a bit strange. And they conclude that the client has to correctly verify the app ID. So if we think back, let me actually go back to that slide. So if we think back to sort of the flow of this protocol, you note that the server sends a challenge together with the app ID. So it's reasonable to say that the server does sort of bind the app ID to the challenge. And the client, if they verify the app ID correctly, um, since the app ID you know, is sort of a loose loose identifier for the server and i say loose in the sense that it's not cryptographic but it is an identifier for the server the if the adversary changes this and the um, client verifies that they can actually catch something like this happening now my issue with that is that the app id is a publicly known value and that there are ways that an adversary can spoof an app id so i don't like this as a binding point and in that sense i don't agree with the outcome of that work because essentially their conclusion is hey as long as the client verifies this, everything is good. And that's sort of true. Uh, I'm not going to say it's wrong, but it, it, it's assuming a lot. <laughs> and it's assuming that the adversary cannot spoof the app ID. And there, there are ways an adversary can do this. There's some other works also using Proverif, where they're looking at things like corrupted authenticators and compromised clients. So it turns out that if the adversary is able to compromise the link between the client and the authenticators, they can do a bunch of stuff. Or if the adversary is able to trick the client into binding their own authenticator. There's a bunch of stuff that can happen, but none of the prior work really discusses the cryptographic binding issue. And in the context of this work, even representing it more as a case study. Does that answer your question sort of? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, in, in the fall, in, in my uh, insure class, there, there was a group of students um, you interacted with who, who looked at authentication. Can you summarize their findings and how it relates to yours? Right. So I mentioned that students in the intro plus C course last semester analyzed FIDO registration. That's something that's something I did want to talk about. I'm, I welcome those students to comment on it and I hope you chime in. But what they found is they analyzed the registration portion of this protocol, which actually closely resembles in many ways the authentication portion. And in that registration portion, there's also a challenge. There's also optional channel binding. And it turns out that that portion of the protocol is the exact same protocol interaction. And this is something that our students in, in the fall confirmed using CPSA. So both, both of the sub protocols of UAF have the same issue. And that's because they both don't bind the challenge under all circumstances.
To what extent do you think the uh, designers of FIDO were aware of this vulnerability? And why do you think they, they made channel binding optional? I think they were very aware. So if we think back to the tech note that I showed, the quote from the tech note, something else from that tech note is the observation that there's likely, and this is their wording, likely a man in the middle attack possible if you don't do this. Now, I will upgrade that likely to definitely because we've implemented one. Um, so they're, they're definitely, their concerns were well-founded. The reason they make it optional is not a, it's not a technical reason, it's for adoption. So the challenge that FIDO is facing or any protocols when you say, okay, I've made this new standard. This is old XKCD cartoon that some of you might be familiar with, where it's like, wow, there's all these different ways to do this. We should make a standard. And then like you make a standard and now there's an, another way to do it in addition to all the previous ways. And so their issue is how do we replace the previous ways or at least get adopted so that we're competing with these traditional password-based authentication mechanisms. And the reality is if you specify something like a draft standard, so the channel binding standard is, is still in draft and you say, okay, every client has to do this. The odds of anybody adopting your protocol and you getting inertia in the, in the industry is close to zero, I think. So I think they're making this decision consciously. Um, and it's worth noting that, you know, if the client does verify the app ID correctly, which correct client implementation would, you're at the very least defending against the most trivial versions of this attack. So I think it's very much a adoption and usability issue for them rather than a cryptographic one. And I suppose that makes sense to me. I'm not a designing protocols for the industry. Uh, so I'm quite concerned about the protocol susceptibility to protocol interaction. And a recommendation that I would personally make to them is that this, that we probably have to require this binding, but they might very well tell me in return, hey, if we do that, nobody will use this and we'll never get this protocol off the ground. And that would be fair. I wouldn't have a good counter argument, you know? What are your future plans for the coming year? So right now we are finalizing the paper that illustrates the stuff I talked about with FIDO. And the plan is to submit that to use Nix Security by the end of March. And further, further on from there, I'm going to continue running protocol analysis workshops. And I'm also going to be working on this automatic binding tool. So that is to say, we're going to be working on some of those questions that I discussed with Mario, like what is a protocol context? How do we represent it? How do we automatically bind messages and CPSA to such a protocol context? How do we have CPSA, a, a tool infer such a context from a CPSA model? Uh, questions like that. So I'm going to keep working on the dream, the dream being that, hey, someday it'd be nice if we don't have to write these protocols ourselves and we don't have to come up with the bindings ourselves. If you're open, I would love to engage in that component and kind of bring you the, the challenges I'm dealing with, because I think it's very relevant for both of us. And, and we, we both come from a protocol analysis background. So love to be a part of that. If, if it makes sense. Absolutely. Um, I, I think it's such a, such a nice coincidence that you're struggling with the same problems right now, but it also, it goes to show that it's not that easy to solve. Right. I mean, you're looking at FIDO for instance, and FIDO is you know, grappling with this issue themselves. And also like note that their binding is, is, you know, fairly specific. Um, and, and that we have to, we ended up having to recommend that they bind the challenge at the server because in the protocol, the server issues the challenge bound only to the app ID, which is, that's not a cryptographic binding. Let's be honest with you, you know? So definitely I'm hoping it becomes a bigger topic in the industry. So I'm like happy to hear that you're, you're dealing with that and that you're explicitly addressing it because many authentication protocols don't like you have things like dual factor authentication protocols, you know, where they issue a challenge to your phone or whatever, and you have no idea if the challenge was for your request or somebody else's. And that tends to be the problem. Last chance. Does anybody in the audience have a question? Dennis, what do you think are the challenges for uh, for the binding uh, in terms of what would be the simplest uh, bindings that you would need? You know, how do we keep this from being? Because I could see where we could get into the situation where you might be throwing everything in to, to produce the bindings. So we don't want to do that, right? Uh, the the right. goal is to find a minimal binding 
So the question is, how do we find a minimal binding for a given protocol? I think part of that has to do with the context inference step. So a major problem with binding is you have to have something to bind to, which is to say, like, my challenge is to identify a context to bind to. The current plan I have for doing that is to essentially bind messages at minimum to the sender and the receiver. So this is sort of like the smallest binding I can think of that would maybe work in a majority of situations is for every message. You'll notice this is how low fixed Needham Schroeder is by just adding like, hey, this is the sender to one of the messages. I think if every message in the protocol binds cryptographically to the sender and to the receiver, it already stops a broad class of protocol interactions. I would say most but of them. You also minimally want the protocol version and the protocol instance. Yeah, binding to the protocol version, protocol instance, the specific message. Because one thing that, so what I said, where we just bind to the receiver and the sender, this I think is pretty good if you're dealing with existing protocols, but a chosen protocol attack might be able to cause a lot of problems with that. And I think that adding this idea of like binding to the protocol instance version specific message complicates the idea of a chosen protocol attack as well. So this is sort of at minimum, probably what you have to bind to. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I could think. I could think of other instances where if you were just bound to the sender and receiver that you would have protocol interactions across uh, instances. Right. Yeah. So that's one thing worth noting is that one of the things we noticed even about the channel binding mechanisms in the RFC is that while they do a good job of preventing the transplant of information between TLS contexts of different the different parties, they actually don't do a very good job of preventing the transplant of message data between instance P of client and server and instance Q of the same client and server. So I haven't really, I haven't really racked my brain on how to exploit an issue like that, but you can imagine that any kind of protocol interaction opens the avenue for a possible attack. And even if, if I have two different sessions with you concurrently, even between the two of us, and maybe an adversary is able to move the data between those two sessions. That can be bad. So I, I agree wholeheartedly with that sentiment. Well, thank you very much. It was a very um, interesting talk. Uh, we'll be back on March 31st. Okay. Thank you so much. And thanks for the great questions.